I've come to acknowledge. Kunezinto ebengabe zenzege gangono. Iska tanga baslashega ngaganje. Ama resources angaba walashega ngaganje. Ama relationships angabe awazanga lima le ngale level. But as a first step towards the future I want. Let's move. I felt guilty. Now let's confess it. So that in confessing it, we can begin the transformation process out of it. That's what we are going to be praying for this morning. You don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell anyone. But I want us to pray in groups. We're going to pray for each other. Because when you come here, one of the things in Funani Chuayel, and guys, it's still early days, we've only been operating for a year. Angrani Entertainment Cinema. It's a spiritual movement. And prayer has to be part of life. If you want to be part of this family. Are we together? Ngazabanye bane entertainment feeling go manje. We are going to a word in life, kune bend, gunani, don't worry. In time, uzo shia. Go bas in a transformation. Uzo figa last estule go guk entertain a corner. Ushi. Uyo fune nyindem nandi. But for, for transformation, we need to also know how to pray for each other. So we're going to break. I want us to break into groups of five. No one is going to tell anyone what they did. But in that group, just two to pray for us. Galomunya Smege for the confession of sins. Someone must just pray for the sins we need to confess. Isn't this But omunya nzala kulegele e confession of wasted time and wasted opportunities. Because we need to heal from it. Uguze sizo guazu uguba fit for the next opportunity God will give. Maybe let me say this even in advance. Some of us cannot see what God is busy doing about today because this is a feel bad about yesterday. We haven't turned around. Okay, yes, but we are so guilty, so broken from yesterday's failures that we are still obsessed about fixing yesterday, not realizing not even God is trying to fix it. He has simply prepared something new. But confess Ungenegui transformation, Gabon Meshugo. Because you feel a guilty, Uzolo Shelly Kenik. Eh? Mishana Malanga Unga Pantigua relationship, Shinju Oyen. Eh? Sasu Pes Guayo blow a casket. Lapizulu Logaliti Yega. Saslungi Sogunye. Yega. But if you don't go through confession that leads to transformation, God has prepared something else. So I want us to break into groups of five. Choose a spot anywhere here in the passage. Just two people. Pray for us. Pray for each other. Okay? Of course, groups can exceed five or be less. If numbers don't even out, that's okay. But I just want us to pray for each other. Pray for each other. You don't have to mention Oguako. You can even just say, guys, Oguamigu special, I really need to be mentioned by name. Ama details I won't say, but yes, I definitely need this. Let us pray with you and let us pray for you. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from 
Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to get into our morning lesson study very quickly. 
then Nipre's team will immediately come up with a band to take us through another section. Okay, how many of you pay attention to my posters, Ms. Wakip? Like, Oba da Bainaga, you post a my poem. Nigani package. Or, Konaba Veleba Boning, a notification. Ogoti, I've posted something and they assume it's just for next Sabbath. Do you ever look at the posters? Okay, you do. All right. What, 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 what's the theme? on the poster for today. <laughs> All right. No, I was just asking because I think sometimes knowing the theme psychologically prepares you and emotionally prepares you for what we are going to be dealing with, okay? Yeah. Um, but also please, just for Gisa Kumbula, Watch out, there will be two posters coming out, one for Holy Communion, uh, including uh, children's dedication. Just uh, look out for those. Uh, that's why I'm going to poster, because I'm going be surprised. We are doing baby dedication, we are doing Holy Communion. So, we are going to be able to do this poster. Do you understand? Yeah. So, one of these days, we're going to be having our uh, Holy Communion service as well as a, a dedication for, for, for the little ones. Um, but if you had had an opportunity, okay, yes, yes, unfinished business and wells for tomorrow. This is a series that I'm going to be doing for almost the next three or four Sabbaths. We are going to be looking at, number one, dealing with the past, dealing with regrets. We need to address that. And then we are going to be dealing with planning now for tomorrow. So we've addressed where we are coming from. We've dealt with the issues. How now do we make better decisions for tomorrow? So it's a series that we are going to be doing. Um, it should take about three or four Sabbaths, okay, so when you see the poster, you will see uh, it will almost remain the same except for the subtitles that will be coming up uh, underneath. Because what we want to do really is legacy planning. Um, legacy planning. And that's important. Uh, particularly, Gyafunu Gisholendo, particularly Gutina, Bantabam Nyama. We've got a legacy challenge, Tina. The black community has a, a serious problem when it comes to legacy planning. It is bad. You know, um, I think Asians and, and, and guys in the Middle East and uh, the, the Westerners are much more ahead of us in terms of planning their legacies. And by the way, I, I must also do give it a context, particularly Maskuluma in the South African context. It, was al it wasn't always like that. Our, our ancestors were very conscious of legacy planning. Very conscious. But when colonialism came, someone taught us we don't need to plan that far. They will do the planning. Do you understand? And now we are trapped there. We are a generation that doesn't know how to do legacy planning. Let me give you an example of it. For those of us who are at least, if you are Umzulu or Umkosa or Swati, um, perhaps, yes, even when you are Tsonga, I may not be sure about the other cultures, but we have something we call Izitagazelo. Okay? Clan names. Okay? I don't know if they are, are they there in other cultures? Um, I've never, like I've never heard, so I'm not excluding because they are not there. They might be there, but I've never heard. So we've got clan names. Uh, clan names, your surname has a history. And in that history are clan names. But think about it. What are clan names? You do your family history, 
clan names are the names of your ancestors and their achievements. Mazibugo wasn't always a surname. It was initially a name of a person. Do you understand? And if I go back, Mazibugo, Konjo, Putin, I keep going back and Z, Mamuela, Sem, Kapamafu, Manzezul, I keep going back, I'm naming individuals. But I'm naming individuals and their achievements. Because Guma clan names, you are also told what your ancestors did. Isn't it? That was how our ancestors planned the legacy. In other words, to be honest, clan names are not supposed to have a beginning and an end. Whenever a generation dies, they should be added. Do you understand? So ultimately, the, the Mazibugo surnames in my family line must one day also get to Ketel. Are you with me? And my name can become a surname three, four generations from now. But my name must also be accompanied by achievements. What did I do? What are we known for? Because that's legacy. And, and as a result, with, with our ancestors, when you are given a name, they were reflecting a number of things. They were trying to prophesy your future, but they were also trying to connect you to the past. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Legacy. And we need to be conscious of it as well. You need to think about it. Song and Jengo Basila, think about it. Sizofa. Mklambebe ungaz. Sengiag updateag. Uzofa. Naming izofa. Do you understand? But something needs to make me immortal. And it's what I leave behind. The only way the human being, at least in this side of the world, before Jesus comes again, the only way we can gain immortality is through the legacy we leave behind. That's how we become immortal. Okay? So, uh, uh, South America, we are now starting our lesson. In South America, there was um, a... a, a, a a nationality, a tribe of people that were known as the Maya and the Inca. Now, the Maya and the Inca believed there are three stages of dying. They said the first stage of dying is when you are alive but you mean nothing. They would say death has begun. We are pillaye na siambon. Go to age konga kaza ugu tu pilelan. For that reason, ugu fasi kali. Ufe hamba. Amazula sho jalang it. To a ufe hamba. Siambon na yena, you know, especially ge kat zoguja, we are vela. We are velisi simbela. And then the Inca believed the second stage of dying is when the physical body dies. And then they believed the final stage of dying, this was their religion. They believed your final stage of dying is when the last person who remembers your face dies. So they believed your spirit remains in your community as long as there's someone who remembers your face. But when the last person who knew how you looked dies, the spirit is then released from this life and it must move on. They, they, now, we are not talking about their faith as a theology, but what they were putting in their children is that number one, be meaningful while you are still alive. Number two, be so meaningful, there will be too many generations that will remember you. So you won't disappear too quickly. And as reminds the sense of the Now, we need to deal with our legacies, but to do so effectively, we also need to deal with where we are coming from, because I think that's one of the key issues. 
So the first thing I want to raise um, to you this morning is that almost every human being has regret. We all regret something at some point, at some time. You understand? There are people who will say, and I've seen even videos, people who will say, no, I regret nothing, that's not true. There is only two ways for never regretting anything. One, you were never present for anything. Or two, you've lost the ability to feel when you're in something. That's the only way you get to regret nothing. But if you're a human being, you're going to make decisions. And some of them, you're going to regret them. You're going to regret their outcome. You're going to regret the consequences. You're going to regret how you handled something. Regret is a part of human life. I need us to understand that. But also, I need us to burst a myth. There's a myth that says you, re you only regret because you didn't plan well. That's not true. You can plan very well. Do you understand? You, you know, I, I, one of the things I regret the most about the internet is that anyone with the data has become a philosopher. Just turn your camera, switch it on. verbal diarrhea we analyze, we balance, we out with the life. You know, we keep and keep, 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 and we keep and we keep and we keep and we in fact, we are online and we keep and we keep and we keep and we keep and we apply and we keep and we keep and we keep and we keep and we video. Because we listen to things that you think, I don't think this person thought, it really took time to think about Lenta by Kuluma, but then Begune Wi Fi Kaya and Dune iPhone 14. What, why not? But when you look at the reality of life, it's that people can plan very well, but life has its own brain. Are you with me? Life has its own brain. And remember, no matter how perfectly you plan your life, you are dependent on other players to make your plan come true. So you can't say, Gi planile No, not unless you are God and self-reliant. But as long as you need someone to do something, you must know that your plan is not entirely foolproof. Do you understand Yes. By 27, I'll be married. But it is again to be so full, Angita aus aus shellwen. So you can't say 27 in fundi sing zobe sing shatil. Loga tum shell ay nu zobe ten. Uya funa yin ye nuk shatanga les katu we no funuk shatangas. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there's no such a thing as so when we see people's lives falling apart, lose the arrogance of saying they didn't plan well. Just because when you made certain decisions which God decided to honor and fulfill as you had prayed, you now assume you planned better. You didn't. Didn't plan better. By the time I'm 35, all my children will be born. 35, no yet. Kwalozo ba ubaba wake agabonaga lingishe inkalwen ugu tu yeza no mata. Ayo ngobu mubi au fundile. Life has its own brain. Life has its own brain. Are you still with me? So, you need to understand that regretting therefore is not a sign that you didn't plan well. Sometimes yes. There can be times where I'm regretting because I did not plan well. But to see someone regretting should not always be equated to you should have planned well. Life could have happened. Life could have happened. But secondly, one of the other challenges that I want to look into when it comes to regret. Regret does not always involve me doing something wrong. 
Sometimes the regret is a result of doing too much right. Sometimes you are in a position of regret because you loved too much. There was nothing wrong. Love should always be poured out. It's just that you poured on someone who will make you regret it. So it's not you who did wrong. You did what is supposed to be done. Are you with me? You loved someone because you were in a relationship. And when you're in a relationship, that's what you do. You love. But the fact that the other person failed to honor it now brings you to a position of regret. So sometimes we think if there is a regret, a fault must be identified. No, sometimes you honestly did what is right. But where you were directing your right actions or where you were directing your right intentions, they did not have the same attitude. Who's tolege? Also we regretful situation. Are we together? So I just wanted to remove those myths first. You're good, I'm regretful because. Then I want to look at the reaction to regret. So there are many characters in the Bible we can take, but I'm going to take four characters and look at their reaction to regret. And I want to put them both on two different sides. Ngapa, I want to put a man called Samson and another man called King Saul, one side. And then I'm going to put this side two other gentlemen. I'm going to put King David and I'm going to put a man called Caleb. Okay? All of them are in the Bible. All of them experienced regret, but look at the way they react. So, oh, Samson, you know, it's in the book of Judges. Eh? Right? Eh? Hey, my babu. You know that there's a book of Judges in the Bible, eh? Sure. Right? Now, there, there's a man called Samson. God, from birth, raises him up in order to use him to deliver his children, the Israelites. Okay, everything goes well. Up until Samson decides to marry a woman who came from the enemy nation. All right? And she betrays him. The enemies capture him. Now, I don't mind the story, Sigar Samson, as we read it in the context of making amends. I'm not there. I am in the act of collapsing the building. Angiti, when his hair began to grow, his story situations in Jani. What happened? Anyone bold enough to raise a hand? Okay. What happened? His strength began to come back. Yes. His strength came back. His hair grew, his strength came back. Uti nigumfan. Uti nigulumfana. Onai. Yebobab. Put me between the pillars. Put me between the, the pillars. Then what does Samson do? He pulls the pillars and it, and the entire auditorium collapses and 5,000 people die. Now, as a hero, I've got no problem, but we are not talking about him as a hero today. I want us to talk about responses to regret. Some of us, our response to regret is mass destruction. Collapse the whole thing with everyone inside. That is why sometimes Kumbuzi le sivuli red yo siswe in dabin gutua indo tisitati spam ya tubulungo skaz ya tubula bantu anayaz tubula nayo. Samson syndrome. Kuna lendengi shayo. Are we together? Angi ibon in jela yogu ilungisa. Song is of elengis lungis a song. Once off. How? Nikonana. Eh? So I'm going to make the whole thing collapse. Because I don't see how it can be fixed. 
And I want us to be very careful of that. That mass destruction response to regret. That mass destruction. You, sometimes you see it on small things. You don't think you have it, but you do. For example, why is it that when the computer is slow, you smack it? It's that mass destruction syndrome. When it frustrates me, go nife, kalwe pants. So you don't think you have it when you are listening to the news and they say a man killed his entire family. You think, how? How can he do it? Yeah? That time, we were to figure office where na ubu shy computer. Lama computer like I ba 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 ba. Like what part of a computer was designed to be smacked, and then it's going to speed up processing? It's the mass destruction syndrome. When it frustrates me, when I regret it, when it infuriates me, I lack the ability to pause, think, step away from it while it frustrates me. Let me pause a bit. Are we together, saints? Yes. When having an argument with someone, then you realize your anger is overtaking your facts. Am I speaking to someone? Then you pause. Because we have a good image of the world, we have a short circuiting. We have a good cable. So, we line where anger, so we have a cross and line where effects. We have a good image of the world. We have a good image of the world. We response. We have a response. We have a good image of Beating people up is one of the strongest signs intellectuality has failed. Violence must take over. We are one of the many to shire. You must know. Lama cells are kabanga, yama neurons. Asapumile rumin. Eh? Sek vele guangena. So, one has to be alert of that. And one of the best things you can do, rather than be a mass destructionist, it's that ability to stop. Feel your temper rising. Feel your attitude of destruction coming in. And close the door. Close the door immediately and say, let me walk away from this. Let me walk away from this. I've seen people being shot in traffic because they couldn't walk away. They start this issue three robots away. And then it gets to that robot where the other one opens the door, comes out, yeah, because I need to F you up. And just as they are approaching, this one also opens the door with an already cocked 9 millimeter and pa, 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 on the floor. Done. Done. Could have driven away. Could have driven. There were three more robots of making different decisions. But the the mass destructionist at a point of regret would rather lose everything than walk away. Then there's King Saul. King Saul has messed up as a king. He's done badly. He has tried to speak to God about it. God doesn't change his mind. 
Okay? So what does salt do? Two things that salt does. Number one, because God will not change his mind, he goes to visit a witch. That's the second challenge of regret. Experimenting with solutions foreign to you in order to undo the past. Some of us are currently spiritually experimenting because we've got things we regret and God is not fixing it the way we want. So we do spiritual experimenting. Let me go see Mama so and so. Because I want to fix it. He is so desperate to be a king again in God's favor that he will visit a witch in order to get God to change his mind. Are we together? He's trying to address his regrets. He disobeyed. He got rejected. He feels so regretful. But God says, we are not going to change this situation. I'm not going to kill you. You will remain a king. But you are the last king from your family. First and last. I've made a different decision. He feels so necessary to change God's decision. He visits a witch. It's like what we see today. Pastors who are so desperate to fill up a church, they work with the devil. It's the most strangest thing. Spiritual experimenting is a big thing in Christianity right now. Footy again with the rise of social media. You guys are really sharing all sorts of get back to your roots, get in touch with your Africanity, eh? theories. And in the process, you are doing spiritual experimenting. And Jesus warned us, by the way, and Jesus said, one human cannot host all spirits because God does not dwell in confusion. You want to experiment, God will pull out. So that you can remain because God does not dwell in confusion. So Saul is now experimenting. Yeah? But look where his experiments led him. Suicide. King Saul dies by suicide. Do you know the story? He went off to fight the Amalekites, remember? In the fight against the Amalekites, he got injured. When he was next to the river, he asked the soldier to pin the sword down for him and hold it so that he can fall into it and die. He died by suicide. And this one I want to say very carefully. Yes, it is true. Some of the people who have committed suicide, it was a regret. There are people who commit suicide because of depression and other mental illnesses. But there are also people who committed suicide because they didn't know how to fix a problem. Girls have committed suicide because they couldn't tell their parents I'm pregnant. It's true. You may think to yourself, what? Yes, they would have shouted at me and what not, but... But some people are so fearful in their family relationships. We've seen girls kill themselves. We've seen boys kill themselves after the girl says, I'm pregnant. And the boy thinks, telling my father, telling my mother that I got a girl pregnant. And they would commit suicide. We've seen people commit suicide rather than go to prison. Yeah? Especially young boys, young girls. You get brought into a crime you know nothing about. Yeah? 
And then as the police begin investigations, and just the knowledge that you may spend the next 20, 30 years of your life in prison, people kill themselves. Sometimes, for example, you look at, especially here in South Africa, I've seen it many times where you find, you know, guys were stealing a car, then there's a confrontation between them and the police, and there's a shootout. Think about it. The shootout is unnecessary. When the police have caught you and have surrounded the vehicle, you could have stopped, come out, laid flat. It's the knowledge I'm going to prison for 20 years that says, better dead than in there. And suicide. It is suicide. They might be killed by the police, but they initiate the firefight because I would rather be in a grave than in a prison for 20 years. So some people, when we face regret, unfortunately, suicide becomes the way to go. Then this side, there is David and Caleb. Let me start with King David. David has messed up. We read his psalm in the morning. David messed up badly. He took someone's wife, killed the man. The child is dead. Remember the child that they conceived together? died. But you know what I love about that story? The Bible says the child got sick. And the Bible says David was fasting and praying for the healing of the child. I want you to look at two kings, similar situations. Saul has messed up. God has made a decision and will not change his mind. Saul's response, experiment that leads to suicide. Look at David, same situation. He has messed up badly. God has made a decision. The child that you and Bathsheba have conceived will not survive. David prays for six days. When the seventh day begins, the Bible says the servants entered his room to tell him the child has died. God has made the decision and did not change his mind. He looks up, he sees them, and the Bible says immediately he knew that the child is dead. Then the Bible says King David got up, took a bath, went to the house of worship. There he worshipped God. Worship can also be a response to regret. Two kings, both facing decisions God will not change. But look at how they respond in their regret. One king experiments and ends up dying by suicide. Another king enters confession. After the confession, he enters worship. That's also a response to regret. You can choose a path of confession that leads to worship. It's an option to regret. Then the final guy is Caleb. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14, Caleb was only 40 years old when they were sent to spy the land. Do you remember the story? When they came out, remember the lies that everyone told? So expect it yes or no. Because no then I can brief you on the story. But men tule angaz noba ne sabugu pendula no manaz. Okay. The Israelite spies lie. They lie about the land. God punishes all of them. And says, Because you have lied, you will be in the desert for 40 years. Because you were in Canaan for 40 days. So for each day in Canaan will be equal to a year in the desert. That's how they ended up 
doing 40 years in the wilderness. At the end of the 40 years, when you go to the book of Joshua, this is what I love. When you get to Joshua, starting from chapter 6 going forward, Caleb comes to Joshua and says, I was there 40 years ago when we failed to enter Canaan land because of our unbelief. Now listen to Caleb. Caleb says, for 40 years I have waited for this period to enter Canaan land again and do what we should have done 40 years ago. And the Bible says at this time, Caleb was 85 years old. So Joshua says to him, my friend, you are 85 years old. 85. Caleb says, I am still as strong today as I was 45 years ago. I have been preserving my strength, waiting for the day when we will rewrite history. There's another way of dealing with the regret. It's to do what Caleb did. Go back, plan, and prepare to do better. And wait for God to give you another season to try again. So there are two approaches here to regret. And as I finish this lesson, I need to challenge you and ask you, what path are you going to take when it comes to dealing with your regrets? Because regrets you will have. But there are two sides to this. You can be an anarchist, an experimenter, and ultimately go into suicide because of regrets. Or you can choose the path of confession, worship, planning, and executing better when God offers another opportunity. These are two approaches. These are two approaches. And beloved, you've got to choose wisely. Why? Because Are you with me? Time is moving. But all we are doing is reminiscing on yesterday. Do you understand? Even as a country, we do it. Sometimes I find myself, last Sabbath, we, we ended up in a very heated debate about South Africa. And I realized we are in those moments again. Are you with me? Why are people wanting to now follow Ozuma in the MK? One thing, it's the failure to plan for tomorrow and miss what was there yesterday. South Africans don't know how to plan for tomorrow. We are always consumed by the beauty of yesterday. Do you understand that President Zuma has zero future for you? Age-wise, constitutionally, he can't offer anything other than speeches. But because we miss what he gave us, we are all hallucinating about the past instead of planning for tomorrow. I've got nothing against him, but there are things he can't change. He will never be president again. The constitution doesn't allow him. And he will never be young again. He does not have the health to lead us for another 10 years. But why don't people think about it? It is the orgasm of rewriting the past rather than the transformation of planning a new future. Why do you think we are all debating? Remember when Tabo Mbegi was in charge? It's the hallucination of the past. Even if you brought Tabo Mbegi back into power, age-wise, he's finished. Listen to the old man's speeches. He's done. Are you with me? But secondly, this is 2024. How he managed an economy then will not apply now. The world has changed quite a lot. But that's what human beings do. We hallucinate about yesterday instead of rolling our sleeves and building a new tomorrow. 
Why? To dream about the past only requires you to sleep. But to go into the future requires you to work. It is easier to dream than to work. That is why even the political parties listen very carefully. I'm using them for an example in a church setting. I'm not doing politics. I'm doing the reality of our thinking. Listen to the ANC's campaign. We've been good to you for the past 30 years. They are not saying this is what the next 30 years will look like. They are saying we've been good to you in the past 30 years. Because it is easier to dream about the past than to put a nation at work for tomorrow. And if we don't wake up from that sleep, now Sam Kuluma at a personal level, I may have used the politics as an illustration, but now at a personal level, if you don't wake up from dreaming about yesterday, yesterday is nice, dreaming about it. Imagine if I had studied become accounting, I'd be a CA by now. Amen. It is so easy to redraft your past than to say, but here and now, Ginale diploma, what do we do with it? Because man, jawi yoni si a. Ogotikwa waufisa is irrelevant. As kulu me manje, manje unale diploma, lo nayo. That's the difficulty of regret. Regret can set a very beautiful trap in the past where it allows you to go and dream and play again. But you don't realize it's katisya hamba. But it's only in tubu pupa about what you could have done better. Even in my relationships. Even in my relationships. Let me tell you why so many marriages are failing. People are dreaming about exes rather than loving the current one. Utandana na wego tu sa shugut wa ye pegaga shunom vula. We are dating Tandega now. Now. The question is what do we do about Tandega's cooking? Not nom vula cooked well. Nomvula is gone. With all her cooking, she left. So clearly the cooking you are dreaming about was not powerful enough to keep the relationship. Are you with me? But that's where most relationships, I promise you, many married people have not begun their own marriage. They are still analyzing where it falls short of the previous relationships. The day you wake up and realize in Shatu Kumbuzil, Umbege et Telela, Umbuge et Tuga Lainjin, go to Logo to Patin Shatu Kumbuzil. Then you are ready to work and make this a happy marriage. But to Mausati, why am I going to give me a ganja opined? Then you are nowhere near being responsible for where you are going. And this morning I want to say to you, stop dreaming. Stop dreaming. The best way to deal with the regret, look at David and Caleb. Confess, worship, plan again, execute again. That's the only way we deal with regret. But dreaming, very soon you will wake up and be shocked you are servant. And you've accomplished nothing. You were busy dreaming about what could be done instead of doing what is doable. 
When you leave here today, I hope the Holy Spirit will have planted the seed of dealing with the regrets the right way. Regrets will always come. But be very careful. There's a trap of dreaming about how things could have been done better. And you will get locked in it for the rest of your life. Walk away from the dream. Start putting in the work in designing a better tomorrow. But if you put it in the way, you can't do it. A lift on 90 kg. Manja will lift on Tandas of Pella. Are you with me? We are no longer there, but you will miss it. You will miss what you could be doing because Upi is in Oguche. Gaganga no spaman then a six pack. Reality is you are here now. And King David and Caleb say to you, there are four things we advise you to do. You confess it, you worship, you plan again, you re-execute. That's the only thing you can do. That's the only thing you can do. Otherwise, I could have done it better. Yes, you could have. But that time is gone. Now let's do something new. Shouldn't have had children at that time. I should have planned better. I got pregnant too soon. Now I'm struggling financially because I didn't prepare for these children. So what? Will the dream send them back to the womb? They are here. All three, all four of them, they are can't be dreaming about your virginity. Can't be redone. Can't be redone. You've given birth to these three children. They are now here, all three of them, and you are unemployed, but they are all here, and you are unemployed. Are you still with me? But they are here. They are here now. There is greater success in planning their future than in regretting their birth. In fact, looking forward has almost a 100% chance you and them will make it. But there's a 100% chance you can't undo them. Confess it. Worship. Plan better. Execute. Praise team. Please come. When your spirit speaks to me 
With, with my, my whole heart, heart I'll agree And my answer will be yes or yes, yes. you've done for me oh. you have filled my life until I overflow oh. all I have is yours to choose uh. any way you choose you're the Lord of Lords so how can I say no oh, I say yes, I say yes. Lord, Lord is yes. to your will Trust you and obey when your spirit when speaks, speaks, to me, speaks to me with my with whole, my whole heart, 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 heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes. Lord, yes. Oh, I'll say, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, I'll say yes. Oh, Lord, Sing the song together. Swing low. Swing low. Swing low. Sweet chariot. Come. Come and fall to carry, to carry me home. Swing low. Swing low. Swing low. Sweet chariot. Come and fall to carry me to carry. To carry me, let's sing the song together. Swing low, sweet chariot, oh, coming, coming for to carry me. Swing low, swing low, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry. Coming 
seen the vessel you can smile at the storm you can smile at the storm you can smile at the storm with Jesus seen the vessel you can smile at the storm as, as we are sailing come again with Jesus come with Jesus seen the vessel you can smile at the storm you can smile at the storm you can smile at the storm with Jesus in the vessel you can smile oh, as we are sailing home sailing home sailing home sailing 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 home, sailing home with Jesus, with Jesus. In the vessel you can smile, in the vessel you can as we are sailing home. Oh, sailing, I'm sailing, oh, sailing. Selling home with Jesus, with Jesus in the vessel you can smile at the storm as we are selling home. Selling, I am selling, selling home, selling home. Come again, one, two. Oh, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Oh, it's good enough. Let's go. Oh, oh, oh. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It is, it is good enough. It was good. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good for Paul and Silas. Oh, it is. Good enough for me. Come on. It makes me love everybody. It makes me love everybody. It makes me love everybody. It is good enough for me. Give me that old time. Give me that old time religion. We missed an opportunity to love everybody. When we love everybody, stand up, shake a neighbor, greet a friend. It makes me love everybody. It makes me love everybody. It makes me love everybody. It's good enough for me. Yes, it makes me love. Yes, it makes me love everybody. Yes, it makes me love everybody. Everybody's good, good enough for me. It makes me love. Rather have Jesus. It makes me love. 
Everybody yes, it makes me love. Everybody's good enough. It is good. Come on, one more time. It makes me laugh. It makes me laugh. Everybody, it makes me laugh. I send you a virtual heart. Everybody, it makes me laugh. We send you the virtual greeting. It's good enough. It is good. One more time. Yes, it makes me laugh. It makes me love everybody. It is good enough for me. We are going to take this opportunity to ask you to support our ministry work financially. Not in Ecclesia. In Ecclesia, we are busy. We want to make a lot of changes. Tina said that in Ecclesia, we are mad. Still, still mad. In Ecclesia, we are not going to do Jesus. As we go to Tina, Tina is doing Jesus. God demands the idea to pay for everything you see in operation. Come now and dig. We go to Saga 15 is all. Some of you get paid. So we are expecting the support to be just a bit on another level. We have our speed point right at the back um, with Usbu. If you are using a card, the banking details are up there if you want to do a transfer. And um, for those who are supporting online, thank you so much for the church online. Um, the details are already beamed uh, for the online platform. You will see them on your screen. Give your hearts to Jesus, give us money. We pay bills here on earth. Jesus takes the hearts for the book of life. We don't want the hearts, we want the money. Thank you very much. Um, and let me also greet uh, those who are following. Especially, there are those who announced themselves. Germany, I saw you. Happy Sabbath, Germany. Thank you for joining us. I saw you, Kenya. I saw you, Zambia. Uh, yes, Kenya, I'll be with you later in the year for camp meetings. Uh, and I saw you. I saw Zambia um, online. I saw the UK um, as well online. Zodwa, Tolosi, I think I saw you as well. Um, if there's any country I missed, it is a given Zimbabwe is there. They just didn't write themselves. But Zimbabwe, I know you are there. I know Botswana is there for a fact. Swaziland is there. Uh, Lesotho, not so much. Um, who? Okay, they were telling Switzerland. Okay, I'm not sure if there might be Switzerland online, but also then um, greetings to all of you. Thank you for joining us online. I'll ask the praise team to come up front um, as we give hearts to Jesus and money to the ministry. Please. I just want to address one small issue. The song that was coming up next says... I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. It speaks for confession, not for ministry. The ministry needs silver and gold. That's how it operates. So don't say the song says, no, no, no. It's about, you know, giving life uh, to Jesus. But we want money, silver, gold. But Tandolake, <laughs> 
Sika 
Ke no man is sure can get more. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Jesus 
Let me greet you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. While I was uh, seated down, I got uh, more updates. Um, I have to also greet Canada, Dubai, um, because Canada and Dubai, uh, Australia um, as well. I greet you also. Um, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Um, the, there's a song that we sang, number 269, uh, A Wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Um, uh, it's a special one because it's the favorite of our uh, drama, um, Ulindo. He loves that song uh, so much, and uh, I think you sang it in a way that really uh, blessed him. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, but also, um, oh, there he is um, at the back. It's Mpendulo's birthday today. Uh, it's Mpendulo's birthday today, and we want to acknowledge every other birthday that took place this week. Do we have birthdays, March birthdays, that came out this week? This week? Um, Okay, please stand, please stand this week, March. We need to see you. Uh, uh, yes, so go on for to Kodasis of Kulegela, Sikulele, praise team, come, come, come and uh, usher them into the new year, and then we pray for them. Uh, come, we must sing them a happy birthday, and we must pray for them. My name is Fisane Masinga, 20th of March. That's my birthday. It's still coming. Still coming. We yeah. <laughs> early. Early retirement. Mama? What is on Charlie? It was on the 11th of March. Okay, but tell us. 6th March. Okay. He says he's uh, shy to stand up, but it was March 6th. Okay. Good. 
Kamalame go Kotomba, Tangsalam Clat twenty three. Still coming. I'm a early retirement. Okay. Come, come, Velasa. Gan Mingalela. Yeah, well, a Suglam and Sanje, Siabong and Onke, Wong Tulela. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Let's just bow our heads as we pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the giver of life, thank you, Heavenly Father, for adding another year in the lives of our brothers and sisters. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have kept them this far. We know you are a God who does not keep spare lives. They are alive because you have a purpose. They are alive because you have a plan. As they will be beginning their new years in this uh, March, Here's my prayer for them, Heavenly Father. May the next 12 months be nothing but the revelation of your purpose. Flood them with the paths that are designed by you. Flood them with the resources to meet out your expectations in their lives. Flood them with your Holy Spirit who will give them wisdom for decision making. Flood them with your grace that will give them the strength to get up should they falter or fail anywhere. Bless them with life. Remove disease and sickness from them. May poverty be not given any authority over them. And may your word direct their lives continually. In the name of Jesus we are praying. Amen. Thank you so much for our message today we are going to Genesis chapter 6 uh, Genesis chapter 6 that's where we are going Genesis chapter 6 have you found it We're going to read together from verse 1 to 8 of Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass when human beings began to multiply on the earth that sons and daughters were born to them and the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves in all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they, were, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of humanity was great on the earth and that all their intentions, including their thoughts, and the reasoning of their hearts were evil without stop. And the Lord regretted that he had made the humans on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart because of this. And so the Lord said, I will surely destroy all humanity that I have created and have placed on the face of the earth. This I shall do to men and the beast." to all things that are creeping and even the birds of the air. For indeed, I am regretful that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let us pray for the word. Father, through your Holy Spirit, grant us now wisdom, we pray, so that we may deal with this word in accordance with your revelation not for the sake of the wisdom of human beings, but for your sake, that glory may come to you and salvation may be experienced, we pray 
in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. The book of Genesis, um, the first of the five books written by Moses, the name says it all. Genesis, genes, DNA, genetics, the beginning, all right? The root of all things, that is why it is called Genesis. And when we get to chapter 6, it begins to tell us a story about the human beings and our expansion on the planet. The story has got a number of difficult things that I will first try to address. And I'm going to say it in advance that the things are difficult. But when one listens to the evidence of the Bible, you can deal with them. It's when you... Um, feeling sorry for the Bible and trying to be a biblical apologetic, that then the things become difficult. But if you accept the evidence in the Bible, you'll be fine. So the Bible begins by telling us that human beings were increasing on the earth. And the Bible all tells us that during this increase, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they then went into them and were born to them these children whom the Bible calls men of renown in other translations. It will call them giants and so on. The first question that people always ask me when we deal with this type of scriptures is, Pastor, where did all these people come from? Because the Bible tells us that there was Adam and Eve and then we know that they had their children, okay? They had first Cain and Abel, you remember? And then the one brother, Cain, killed the other brother, Abel. We remember that story? Mm. People always forget we are the descendants of Cain, not Abel. We are not the descendants of the righteous guy, he got killed. We are the descendants of the murderer. It's the and his other siblings. Just by the way, people, I always notice when we read that story, people want to distance themselves from Cain, like, oh, murderer. Yeah, but the other guy died with no children. Okay? But then we are still walking that question, so then where do all human beings come from? Now, here is something I'm going to say to you. Please listen to me very carefully. I'm really going to be as careful as I can when I say this. Please listen to me very carefully. The Bible is not written to explain every detail of God's creation. It is written only to tell us those portions that are related to the birth of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible is written only to tell the story of salvation, not to tell the story of everything God has ever done. I hope in Yangi's recruiting team. Every story in the Bible was carefully selected because it tells something that will relate to Jesus. God left out other stories. The story does not, the Bible does not tell everything God has ever done. It only tells you the things that concern salvation. Okay, just by looking at your faces, I can see some of you already, your faith has entered a crisis. <laughs> and I'll show you what I mean. After Cain killed Abel, God comes to punish him for killing Abel. God says to Cain, I will put a mark upon you, a mark that shows you are a murderer. Wherever you go, the mark will tell you I am a murderer. Cain replies, please Lord, show me mercy. Because when I live here, and the people of the east meet me, and they see the sign, they will kill me. Who are the people of the east? If there is only Adam, Eve, Cain and Abel. Who 
are these people of the East is talking about? You get to Genesis 6. We are now told of sons of God and daughters of men. Who are these people? And that's the point. When you use the Bible to answer questions it did not ask, you will make conclusions for God he did not authorize you to. When God created, there is so much we don't know. There is so much we don't know. We don't know why there are people of the East. Yet we don't hear the story of how they came to be. We don't know what is the fullest meaning of the sons of God intermarried the daughters of men. And that's the point. Nowhere in the Bible are you expected to answer it. Because the Bible is not written to exhaust the details of God's creation. Only to address how sin came, how God solved it. So anyone who wants to know the details of creation, I'll tell you the solution. Believe in Jesus. Be there at the second coming. You will have an audience to ask those questions. But if you say to me right now, and I say this, even when we were studying theology, I argued it flat out until my professors submitted that you might be correct, but let's not make it a public acknowledgement. And the argument I was making is simple. Because the Bible mentions people of the East and sons and daughters of men intermarrying, it is clear that God did more than what we know in Adam and Eve. And let's leave it there. Let's let God be God and humans be. God did something. We can't explain it. But that's okay. Not knowing it does not shortchange your salvation. The foundation of our salvation is faith in Jesus, not accurate understanding of God's details. We are not saved through a detailed knowledge of what God did. We are saved through belief in what God did. Even the birth of Jesus is a mystery. But salvation does not depend on understanding the science of it. It depends on believing the results of it. Oh, am I making sense? How exactly flesh and spirit fused? Come now. No one can explain. How exactly the spirit entered Mary? No one can explain. But here's the good news. You do not require its understanding in order to be saved you are only asked to believe it. Now you are saying, why must we believe it when we don't understand it? But do you not hear yourself? There's a reason it's called faith. Precisely because it does not call for your understanding. If it was an intellectual process, God would have made it a cause in school. And there would be a chapter in the Bible explaining that now the atoms of the Holy Spirit, eh? Do you understand what I'm saying? We know the biology of human reproduction. Why? Because its science has been handed by God over to us. That's why we can study it. We can sit in a classroom, they tell us about a spermatozoid and an ovary, eh? and they tell us about the X chromosomes and the Y chromosomes and how it takes 23 from the mother, 23 from the father, and they pair together to form the first 46 chromosome strand. We know that because the science of it, God left for the pleasure of human intellectual discovery. But for salvation, God gave us a product and said, believe in it. Are we together? So if you read there, I'm saying it so that when you are doing your own personal Bible study, 
You come across these verses and, they were, and the people of the East are going to kill me. Who are the people of the East? I don't remember seeing a verse about God creating anything other than Adam and Eve. Who, who are these sons of God intermarrying the daughters of men? I am saying to you, never fear such complex verses. Don't be afraid of them. God left them there. He was confident. He knew they, are, they should be there. But more than anything, in them being there, they are also a clue that we don't know everything. And faith in God just requires that humility. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's because if there's one thing I strongly dislike about us churches, organizations, it is the addiction to always have a conclusive answer. I don't know why churches are bothered with just the admission, hmm, we're not so sure. The, the Bible is not conclusive on this one. We are not so sure. There is this obsession in Christianity. It must have a conclusion. And that obsession has led us into making assumptions on God's behalf which have no scripture to defend it. Because of the obsession, there must be a conclusion. No, there doesn't have to be. Maybe you guys struggle with it, but I, I thank God he freed me from it. There are many verses that I read and I realize, oh, there's no conclusion to this matter. Okay. The Bible didn't finish it. Okay. So if you came and asked me what to do, I'll tell you it's open. It's between you and God. Go and do what you have prayerfully discussed with God and with a clean conscience you believe it's the right way to go. Why? Because I don't have a verse that concludes the issue. That means God is comfortable to walk with his people in that tissue individually. He's okay. He can walk it with you and you say, Lord, I've spoken to you, I've prayed about this, I've studied your word. The more I study, the more I pray. This is my way out. Okay. He may be going through the same thing. It's okay. It's okay. The church on earth is not called to make conclusions for God. It is may only called to guide God's people as they walk their journey on earth. So there are conclusive things. There are things that are conclusive. We read the Bible, we can see the beginning, we can see the end. The teaching is complete. We know where God is taking us. We are all clear. But there are parts where we don't have conclusions. I cannot tell you what exactly happened at the beginning when God created. All we see in Genesis 1 and 2 is a summary. But the details of it we do not know. I cannot conclude for you where the people of the East came from. There have been suggestions. There have been. Are you with me? Some have suggested it's that because the Bible does say that Adam and Eve had many more children after Cain and Abel. So others have suggested it's, it's all the children of Adam and Eve. Okay, it's a possibility. But is there a conclusive answer in the Bible to support that possibility? No. There's no verse that actually says that is what happened. Okay? Even the fact that he, Cain, doesn't say my brothers and sisters will kill me. He says the people of the East. Huh? And believe me, this guy knows the difference between people and a brother. When God asked him, where is your brother? He said, am I my brothers? He's not confused. He knows siblings. I think if they were siblings, this is just my view, if they were siblings, he would have said, then all my mother's children, my father's children will kill me. He says, when the people of the East see me. So is it possible it was the children of Adam and Eve? Sure. It's very possible. Very, very possible. And that's the point. The scripture is not conclusive. So live with peace, not knowing what is the conclusion. God is at peace with you not knowing. You be at peace as well. <laughs> okay? 
Who are these sons of God who intermarried with the daughters of men? We honestly don't know. For that matter, this, this text is complex. Sons of God, it, it, it almost suggests some kind of divine beings. Yeah? So we don't know what this text means. We don't know. We, we don't know. And, and, and in, your, in your faith in God, be at peace. If he left it like that, he's okay with it. Like that, you'll be okay also. You remember the universe is not yours. Don't be offended. Like it's the story of your creation that is incomplete. It's the story of his creation. And we are that creation. Are we together? All right. So, then the Bible continues. And then it gets to what we want to speak about and then we go home. Then the Bible says, Then God looked and saw as human beings are now increasing all over the planet. The Bible says, he saw, he saw that their thoughts and their reasoning was continually wicked. They were not taking a break. From the moment they wake up, they are conceiving evil. Ah, Kosyam. Ah? Be driver. In God, in God, in Holy Lenji. He says he saw they were continually obsessed with evil, human beings. Huh? Now, some of us may not understand this, and, and I think if you don't understand it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But there are people who live in a brain that is traumatized by attraction towards evil. There are people like that. There are people whose minds don't function unless they are seeking pain. Yeah? Beginning of this year, I watched a documentary about a guy who was a serial killer. Huh? He is suspected of killing 16 women in the United States. He would throw their bodies um, naked next to highways. But they only found eight. Now they shoot a video of him. He has been in prison for years. This guy, when they show him, the, 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 the journalist interviewing him, because the, the journalist, she was writing a book about him. She's showing him pictures of the people he killed and the state he would leave them in. He looks at them and the guy says, I, I did that, didn't I? I did that. I did that to them. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, that's quite sad. I did that to them. <laughs> I did that. He is not at the point of regret. He is at the point of fascination. He is like a painter admiring his artwork. We are born a legacy. Minga kishwaksa sagula ma presidential amnesty eswatandai. There'll be sixteen more on the streets in the next two weeks. Because he is empty of the ability to do what makes people happy. It is when he is inflicting pain that he finds some form of joy inside. And the Bible says, God saw. Now comes trouble. And the Bible says, and the Lord regretted. That's the problem word. Why would God, why would God allow such a controversial word to be used to describe him? Knowing the word gives us an exegetical crisis. The Lord regretted. Wait a minute. 
we, we, we think God is all-knowing. We think God knows the past, the present, and the future. God regrets? Why is God regretting? This now challenges our notions of God. Of course, some of you, you are fine. You don't see where the problem is. Huh? But for some of us, we've picked a problem. Because the verse challenges our ideology of God. In the Hebrew, the word is nikum. And even when you go to the Hebrew, it won't give you any... You know, sometimes when we look at words in Hebrew, we see a difference of approach. And we are able to say, ah, no, the English didn't get it well. This one, the problem is there is no difference of approach. Nakum literally meaning to regret, to comfort one's self because you are in pain, eh? to relent, to wish to create a distance between yourself and what is causing you regret. So it's not me. It's the scriptures saying God regretted that he had made human beings. But then now it leads you to what might seem like a contradiction. But the Bible says the plan of salvation was laid even before the foundations of the earth were laid. So if he knows he's going to save us, if he knows exactly what he plans to do, why is he full of regret? And that's the point that the story wants to teach. That God, and please listen to the key issue. It comes in the following verse. And it says, for God was grieved concerning human beings. There lies the key. Because what the Bible wants to teach us is that even God, who knew he could save us, because of how much of himself he had invested in us, knowing he could save us, did not save him from the pain of being disappointed. As much as he has a plan to save, please follow me very carefully. He has invested so much in the human. He can't stop himself from being disappointed. The fact that my son has failed grade whatever. I know, hear me very well, I know we can get him help to pass it next year. But I feel the pain that he failed this year. Knowing I can fix it does not excuse me from the investment in it. You know what this says? It says, it answers the question why God didn't destroy everything. It is because, contrary to what we think, God is not an emotionless, unaffected deity. He actually is emotionally invested in the things he creates. That is why, almighty as he is, he can't escape suffering pain when it disappoints him. Why? Because for him, it wasn't just, maybe let me phrase it this way. What this scripture teaches us is that God doesn't create because he's powerful. He creates because he's in love. If he created because he's powerful, its behavior would not affect him. He would simply erase it and start again. But because he is in love, he can't escape the pain 
when it disappoints him. <laughs> you see, one day some of us here will be multimillionaires, and I pray that for you. Amen. But listen to me. The first car you will buy for your child will be for them an asset of your capacity. But the first car you bought yourself was a love issue. Because itini motesis tenge manje were not bought out of our abundance. They were bought out of our hard labor. That's why Gesonto si washa si ze si buke. Si raunde. That time in a nine years. Ulo gui raunda. Baze baz buzu uti. Ui raundela ni imoto ka 2010. I'm in love. These four wheels represent prayer, hard work, assignments, exams, frustrations, all of it is here. But the day we buy cars for our children, <laughs> it will be just another car among cars in this family. Are you with me? That's why my wife and I had this conversation with our firstborn. Uh, we say to him, okay, you are going to university now. Should we get you a quid? He says, I'm okay with public transport. Not a quid. Now, please listen to me. I'm not angry. It's a statement of privilege. It reveals God's faithfulness to the family. Menangang show you eight kilometers going to school a day. Four kilometers in Gia, Kwapata. Four in Gibuya. Ilanga Nemvula, Wabu Zenzela. I would go to school. It would start raining. And it would stop when I get to school as if it was targeting me. <laughs> huh? I would come out of school, it starts raining. When I get home, it stops. But it was in those walks that I learned to pray. Those four kilometer walks alone are where God and I were making covenants that we will not die here. We will not die here. God, we will not die here. One day, we will leave this place. We will not die here. Our children will not be born here. That is where conversations were done. Now, now, right now, Sabbath. Eh? Church will finish. We will go. And you know what happens? When you are driving home, the, the children say, can we stop at McDonald's? And you think to yourself, there was a time when I was going home and there was nothing to eat. But this time my house has food in the fridge. My children say they don't want it. No, no, no. Don't get angry with it. It is a moment to acknowledge God's faithfulness. Says Hambe, says a safiga lie in Ganzami, Ziguazugus Ketela. So understand, God regrets because He's in love, not because He's weak. He has power to destroy, but when you are in love, destruction doesn't come easy. Please listen to me. When you are powerful, destruction comes easy. But when you are in love, it doesn't. That is why there's, a, there's this proverb that comes from women. When a woman, like we are sitting in church now, 
when a woman hears her child crying outside, there is that proverb that says, Gusike Gumina. Hey, this one has no English translation, beloved. Those of you who know English online, tell them. There are some things you don't know how to, to take to English. But it is when, when your child cries, you relieve your labor pains. That's why any woman here who has a child, when your child cries outside, my someone flies out the door. Your ears are there. You need to know what is happening. Are you still with me? Why? Because the one beating your child is powerful. You are in love. The sound of your child crying activates two different things. That lady out there hitting your child is exercising power. But you, when you hear that voice crying, you are in love. You hear something else. Why do you think as parents we are in denial? Your child will smoke drugs, the school will tell you, will say never. <laughs> never, my child. Why? You are in love. And beloved, when you are in love, pain is unavoidable. So when you read this story and you say, how could God regret? Does he not know tomorrow? And all of these things, you are making a mistake. You are asking questions of power. He is making a love statement. That he loved us so much. Though he knew he could save us, it didn't change the pain he felt watching us deteriorating. He knows he has a plan. He knows his plan will work. But love doesn't excuse him from feeling the pain of watching your creation fall apart. That's why I said in the morning, to avoid regret, you need to be either absent or have no feelings. Because anyone who has a capacity to love will have a capacity for regret. Even God regretted. But regret was not a sign of weakness. It was him revealing how much he loves us. He could not get over the pain of watching us falling apart. But as I finish this message, this is also then what I want to say to you. When you find yourself full of regret, when you find yourself in pain because you wish you had done things differently, may I remind you that the very God who made you also went through regret. Regret is not proof you are a failure. Regret just announces that you were invested in this. And beloved, it's okay to be hurt when you were invested in something. I want you to stop this thing of trying to pretend you are strong. If you had invested in something, it's okay to suffer when it falls apart. Because right now we live in a world where social media wants to make robots out of us. For, for your mental health, protect yourself. Don't get invested. What a lie. Then you are not a human. The human is an investing creature. Do you hear me? I'm invested in my wife. And if anything was to happen to her or to us, I can't stand in front of you and preach as normal as if I've not just lost the love of my life. I will have to honor her with a breakdown because I was invested. All these years together, I wasn't playing house. I was building a life. 
These days we are being told, free yourself, divorce that person, walk away. That's why you are having mental breakdowns down the line. Because the system is telling you, you did not process the pain with the honor it deserves. If you are human, you will invest. And if you invest, you will regret. But that's okay. It's not proof you are weak. It's evidence you had put all of yourself in it. And never feel bad for that. Even God regretted because he had put all of himself in us. Now the next time you read Genesis when it says we were made in the image of God. Then you will understand why when we failed he was in pain. Because he had put all himself in us. But that's also the reason why he chose to save us rather than destroy us. Because to destroy us would have been like watching himself kill himself. And he had put in too much. That is why at Calvary he actually chooses to kill himself. Because he is so in love with us. And by the way, he had tried it. Huh? He brought the flood to kill those who were sinful. Guess what? After the flood, he discovered he's still not okay. Their death didn't heal him from loving a sinner. There are some regrets you might have. But what I'm addressing right now in this message is don't feel like a loser. Regret simply means you had invested your time, your heart, your money. Don't feel bad. It is human to invest yourself. And it is human to feel pain when things fall apart. Stop putting yourself under the pressure to never be regretful. Even God couldn't escape being regretful. If there are things that have gone wrong, here's what I want you to do today. Honor yourself by grieving them. It was not a joke that you went through them. Grieve. Because you were not playing life, it was life. Grieve it. Grieve it. I lost my job. No, you can't wake up tomorrow after losing a job and act like nothing happened. Your livelihood is gone. The car might go. The house might go. That's not small. Don't wake up and pretend you're okay. Because pain is a debt that is never forgotten. Grieve it. Stop this thing of going to social media, writing big statements, good readings to bad friends. You are a liar. They were your friends. You loved them. Yes, they've betrayed you. Stop pretending to be strong. Grieve them. Grieve. I thought she was my best friend. I thought he was my best friend. I trusted him. I trusted him. Grieve. Stop being a social media philosopher. Grieve. Let the heart heal because the loss was real. You've lost a parent. How bakalelani? Who go kubesem tala? Who go kwa kuma wam? Ena ninety angelo. Who mama? Wam. Grieve them. Grieve them. Grieve them. Because human beings should never feel like failures for regret. It simply shows we had invested 
and it's okay. Now like God, it doesn't mean we don't have a recovery plan. Having a recovery plan doesn't mean don't grieve. It just means we want to honor the fact that we had put ourselves in this. Some of you are not okay because you've been avoiding grieving something. You think it will make you look weak in your faith. You think it will make you look unstable. Let me tell you what is unstable. It's when that huge dam of grief you've not allowed to open. One day when it cracks for itself and all those emotions rush out, that day you will be crazy. Don't force the heart and the mind to break the walls. Honor them. They want to cry over their loss of a job, of a best friend, of a girlfriend, of a boyfriend, of a husband, of a wife, a brother, a sister, a parent, a child. It's okay. Regret it because you were in love. Cry over it. And then, then the plan for recovery will kick in. And it will work because the dam is empty. Can't try a recovery plan on a full dam. It will fail. God regretted it. Felt it. And then saved us. It's okay to regret. Shall we rise to pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we have come to acknowledge this afternoon some hurt and pain. We have come also to acknowledge some regrets. Hear me now, Son of God, as we pray to you. First, I want to pray and acknowledge those of us who are grieving missed opportunities. Who reflect and realize perhaps had I made a better decision, had I used that opportunity differently, my life might have turned out better. Son of God, hear me now as we pray to you. We've come to regret and grieve the people we have lost. Some among us, this year, last year, five years ago, ten, we buried a loved one and we've not been okay. We buried our mothers, we buried our fathers, our grandparents, our siblings, our children. And they kept telling us, time heals all wounds, but we are still not okay. We've come to grieve. We've come to express our pain. Because we were in love, Jesus. Some... Some among us need to grieve broken relationships. Lost best friends. Lost spouses. Some were married but it had to end. Some were on the door of getting married and it had to end. Oh Lord Jesus. We have to grieve. The lost relationships, the best friends that we thought we would have all our lives only to realize we were their best friends, they were not ours. 
we lost those relationships they were meaningful to us Jesus and some of us are struggling to get over them to the point that we have not made any friends since then because we haven't healed we regret it we feel stupid we feel used we feel we missed the signs we are blaming ourselves we feel incompetent to make any wise decision in the future we feel trapped some of us heavenly father we have come to grieve lost time time wasted maybe we are looking around we are looking at age mates we are looking at how far they are and then we are putting ourselves under the pressure of time we are saying to ourselves if they have houses if they have cars if they have marriages if if they are traveling the world doing holidays in Dubai and here I am asking for e-wallets surely father I am the greatest fool under the Sun and I regret time I regret life itself Lord help us Lord help us because if we do not grieve and regret properly we may never recover we may be trapped perpetually in pain and we may never come okay now father though you yourself regretted yet you had a plan so here's my final prayer while we are dealing honestly with our loss and our pain also show us the plan show us the plan where to from here when the tears stop falling when the guilt disappears when the fear is buried where to from here because we learned from you that regret did not mean you did not have a plan show us a plan as well for some of us dear Jesus the time has come to end the grief and begin the plan someone here has grieved enough regretted enough the dam is empty but they don't know what to do now almost to the point where they wish the dam was full again because grieving had become their identity but if you Lord are now making a call then it's time to march forward then show us where to go the days of grief have come to an end for some of us shine your light and show us the way point to where we must go next so that we may rebuild our lives and do better show us Calvary where the problem gets solved where we stop grieving and we start solving show us the grave of Aramathia where we resurrect from death and grieving ends and a new life begins a job has been grieved now show your child where to make money next a relationship has been grieved now show your child where love will come again a death of a loved one is being grieved now show us where we will find peace even though we are no longer walking with the loved one where do we go now to live life in the absence of the one we loved show us the way show us the way so that we may never build a permanent house in grief but we may know that there is life tomorrow and the day after and the day after that in the name of Jesus I pray that you heal us today 
May each and every one who is hearing the sound of my voice live today with the blessing of healing, a blessing of restoration, a blessing of the revelation of a plan of where to from here. For we pray to a God who not only regretted but also had a plan. In the name of Jesus the Christ who was the plan and the solution, we pray. Let all who believe say amen. amen. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Sabbath. We hope to see you again next Sabbath. Go well. God be with you. God keep you. As we live the... Okay. As we leave, music will be happening here. You may sit and enjoy the worship, or you may quietly walk out. Uh, Horeb, let's not uh, quickly switch off. Just allow people online to join, enjoy the worship. Thank you so much. God be with you. We want to do a special item today. Please don't go. We have a, one of the musicians are in the house. Can we ask them to bless us before we go? Is that fine? Yes. yes. Please let's sit still. I greet the church in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Hallelujah. Let's clap hands for Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Amen.